You can afford anything, but not everything. Every choice that you make is a trade-off against something else. And that doesn't just apply to your money. That applies to your time, your focus, your energy, your attention, anything in your life that's a scarce or limited resource. And that opens up two questions. First, what truly matters? Second, how do you align your decision-making around that which truly matters? Answering those two questions is a lifetime practice, and that is what this podcast is here to explore. My name is Paula Pant. I'm the host of the Afford Anything podcast. Every other episode, we answer questions that come from you, the community. And my buddy, Joe Saul Cihai, resident of the great state of Texas, is here with me to answer these questions. What's up, Joe? I think it's funny that you call me a resident of the great state of Texas, because now that you've been to Texarkana, mm -hmm. you know that I live like 800 yards inside <laughs> of Texas. Like I am barely <laughs> hanging on by my claws to Texas. <laughs> so if you go to Instagram, my Instagram's at Paula Pant, P-A-U-L-A-P-A-N-T, you will see a photo that Joe took of me doing a backbend over the Texas-Arkansas state line. Yes, she's half in Arkansas, half in Texas, in, fr in front of our most iconic building, which is we have a courthouse right downtown. It's a beautiful, huge building. And uh, as you walk down, it's one of the few buildings in the nation where it is courthouses for two different states in the same building. So the hallway between them is right on the state line. And if you go to the left, you're in the Texas state courts. And if you go to the right, you're in the Arkansas state courts. It's a weird <laughs> building. That's really cool. Yes. That's really cool. There's also a street in Texarkana where uh, apparently they, Texas and Arkansas had very different liquor laws. And so the street runs down the state line. And so you see all of the liquor stores on one side. I forget what, whether it's Texas or Arkansas, but it's on one, one of the two sides. Yeah, it's on the Arkansas side. It's yeah, on the it's Arkansas just liquor side. store, liquor store, liquor store. And on the Texas side, nothing, nothing, nothing. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. It's a quirky place that, that I live. But we're here today. we got some great questions. We're, we're talking weddings today. We are. We're talking weddings. We're talking about where to keep your savings that you plan on using in between three to five years, meaning that we're talking about how to handle money that has a short time horizon. A side helping of insurance discussion. Yeah. We're going to have a whole in term life insurance conversation. Those are always fun. So there's a lot of ground that we're going to cover. Let's get started. Our first question comes from Anonymous. Joe, we give every Anonymous caller a nickname. What's inspiring you right now? Well, I just saw a film a couple of days ago on Netflix called Red Notice. And it's kind of like, uh, have you ever seen National Treasure or even any of the Indiana Jones stuff where they're after kind of a crazy treasure? And Joe? it's how many years have you known me? <laughs> you haven't seen any of these. Have you not yet learned that if you begin a question with the words, have you ever seen? The answer is no. Exactly. I wasn't actually asking you. I was asking the audience more. Audience, because Paula hasn't. <laughs> Have you ever seen any of those Indiana Jones or National Treasure movies where they're after a great treasure? And these are three eggs, these beautiful, ornate art eggs. And it stars Dwayne Johnson and Ryan Reynolds and Gail Godot. So uh, uh, the movie, by the way, is absolutely awful. It's horrible. <laughs> I, I don't recommend seeing it, but I think because that's the last thing I saw, we should name her Gail. I thought her name was Gal, G-A-L. Well, in my head, it's Gail. I always, <laughs> I see Gal Gadot and I always put an I in there because my cousin's name is Gail. So, so we're going to call her Gail. We're, what? But her name is Gal. <laughs> You know what? We'll alternate. I'll call her gal. You call her Gail. And that's how we'll address her for the duration of the question. It's just a mess already. We're four <laughs> minutes in and it's a mess. All right. Our next question comes from Gal. Gail. Hi, Paula. I'm getting married soon. And I'm in the early stages of wedding planning. The hardest part has been creating a budget. And I wanted to get your thoughts. I searched for wedding questions on previous Afford Anything episodes and found none, so I hope this question is helpful to others out there too. How much should my future husband and I spend on our wedding? We are paying for the entire wedding ourselves. We do indeed want a wedding, not a courthouse or elopement. We have no financial assistance from family or friends. And here's the numbers. 
which I've approximated for simplicity's sake. We are both in our early 30s and are fairly well situated. I make $85,000 annually with an anticipated bonus of $20,000 at the end of this year, and I have about $5,000 in cash savings. I also have $65,000 in various retirement accounts and contribute approximately 20% of my income to these accounts annually. My annual expenses are about $45,000. My fiance makes $83,000 annually, has $45,000 in his retirement accounts, and about $15,000 in savings. His annual expenses are around $50,000 annually. Neither of us have significant debts other than our house and pay off our credit card balances in full every month. We owe $220,000 on our house with an interest rate of 3.75 and an equity of $110,000. We're both interested in getting into rental properties eventually, but are not in a hurry. Neither of us want to retire super early. We're targeting our mid to late 40s. So Paula, how much do you recommend we spend on our wedding? We know this is a very personal question, but strictly from a realistic and responsible financial perspective, what do you think would be a reasonable budget? We'd also love to hear Joe's perspectives. Thank you. Hey, Gail. Gal. (laughs) Thanks for for the question. And you know what? I have become, Paula, first of all, let's just talk about a wedding by itself. I have, my feelings about this have changed immensely over time. I, when I was young, I thought that having a big Cinderella type wedding was, would be fun for me and my future bride. And I thought that that would be just a heck of a heck of a splash. I remember when, uh, I would go to weddings that were big weddings about how fun they were and -hmm. how great a party that was. And then I saw the price tag. And as Mm -hmm. I became a financial planner and I saw so many people struggling to meet their goals, I thought, what a ridiculous use of money this is. This is an absolutely horrible use of money. And then I became uh, less judgy about it. And I realized that, that frankly, if this big party is one of your big goals and your other big goals are taken care of, spend money however you want to. Mm-hmm. So, so the first question is that, that I have is where does this fall in terms of priorities against your other goals? So as an example, she talks about retirement. She said not too early, mid to late forties, which I think by the way is amazing that this community is so badass that they think mid to late forties isn't that special. That's a monster early retirement. If you look at the real world, people struggle to retire by the time they're 65. I would call that the default world, not the real world. We live the, in the, the real world. That's Well, that's true. Good point. <laughs> the default world. Yes. So we can agree on that, even though it's Gail. Gail. The, so I think the fact that she's internalized that so much, that that's not anything special, I think is really cool. But, you know, doing the math between she and her future husband's retirement dollars, you know, let's say that that is more important. That's super important to her to be able to do that. She said she's in early 30s now and wants to to hit financial independence in mid to late 40s. So if we use this rule called the rule of 72, where you take the interest rate you think you're going to get, you divide it into 72, that tells you how many years it's going to take your money to double. So if we use a fairly conservative number like 8%, 8 divided into 72 means every nine years. If we take early 30s and she's 32, that means her money's going to double when she's 41 and it's going to double again when she's 50. So if between she and her husband right now, the nest egg they've already saved is roughly $110,000, that's $220,000. And if they wait till 50, Paula, That's $440,000 she has saved now. So I'm guessing that as aggressively as she's saving, she might end up just a little bit south of a million bucks by that time. She's going to struggle to reach that goal where where she is right now. So if, if that early retirement goal is more important than the wedding, then I would make the wedding budget really small. And I would then be all hands on deck to get this mid to late 40s goal. If the mid forties is nice, but she really doesn't care too much about it. And, but she really cares about that nice wedding. Then have a bigger budget for the wedding. 
Mm. One comment that I'll make on the math that you just outlined is to remember that the purchasing power of that money in the future will be non-equivalent to what it is today. And so the total return is represented by an inflationary increase plus, ideally, an increase that is in excess of inflation. So to take that 8% number, if we assume that inflation progresses at a rate of 3%, then it means that your real return in, in terms of purchasing power would be around 5%. So that's just something to bear in mind when you're making future projections. Yeah, we're seeing a million dollars now is not what a million dollars used to be. I just remember when I was a when I was a kid, a million dollars was a bundle of money. And don't don't get me wrong, it still is a nice sum of money. But if we apply a rule like the four or five percent rule, that's a forty thousand or fifty thousand dollar a year lifestyle. Twenty years ago, that was a fantastic lifestyle. Now it's a good lifestyle if you have no debt. I think you can definitely you can definitely do that for a long period of time, but it's not at all what it was. Prices double about every 20 years. So really what was a million dollars, what a million dollars bought you 20 years ago back at the turn of the century is now two million to reach that. And that actually jives well with the rule of 72. So rule of 72 Prices double about every 20 years. So historically, inflation has progressed at about a 3% annual rate. 72 divided by 3 is 24. Yeah. Gal, I agree with Joe's advice about figuring out what your comprehensive list of goals are. Like, fu like fundamentally, here are the variables that you would need to write out on a piece of paper. What goals do you have? How much roughly will reaching that goal cost? And what duration of time do you want to achieve that goal in? So if your goal is to retire at the age of X, let's say 48 or 50, and there's Y amount of money that you'd like to have in your portfolio at the time of retirement, then based on those numbers, you can then reverse engineer how much money you would have to set aside every year between now and then, given certain return assumptions. And there are loads of online calculators that can help you figure that out. So that's a, a way for you to math out that retirement goal. Then think through any other goal that you have. You mentioned potential rental properties. I don't know whether or not you want to have children, but if so, you might want to have a fund set aside for unanticipated expenses related to that. For example, if you end up needing IVF treatments, I don't know if you have any travel goals, but sit down, and this is an activity that the two of you should do together, of course, sit down and list out the goals that the two of you share, how much you'd like to save for each of those, and how much that's going to cost, and reverse engineer to see how much you would have to save in each designated bucket for each designated goal. And then typically when people go through this exercise, they find that their list of goals and the list of savings amounts that they need in order to reach those goals exceeds what they can realistically save. That's typically what happens. And so when that occurs, then you've got three choices. You either eliminate a few of those goals or downgrade the budget on some of those goals, or extend out the timeline on some of those goals, or some combination of all of the above. I took a look also in preparation for this question, the popular website, the knot.com, and the average cost of a wedding. And here's something interesting that, that, that happened. And while we don't know the reason, the average cost of a wedding in 2019 according to the knot, was $28,000. In 2020, that went all the way down, Paula, to $19,000. Now, there's a couple things. Obviously, COVID hit, right? Mm -hmm. And because of that, the guest list shrunk. Mm. Also, I think that wedding halls were probably hurting for business and may have severely discounted the numbers. But I think in terms of the piece that we could we can control – what I find is that that weddings often become unwieldy when you start just just deciding how big a party you want. It gets bigger and bigger and bigger 
and less constrained. And I think sometimes constraints are fantastic for creativity. So if you put yourself a decent constraint on what what type of party or event you want to have, you can still have something that's really beautiful and nice, I'll bet, for maybe not $19,000 if it's still the average uh, versus 28,000 because of the fact that the, you know, hall prices are going back up to what they were before. Your providers are less likely to discount things like I'm sure they were in 2020 discounting a lot of things just to stay in business. But still, I think that I'm just thinking of some of the weddings that I've gone to where they've either limited the guest list so they could preserve the place that they had the wedding. I remember there was this beautiful country inn that a friend of friends of ours had uh, a wedding at. It was beautiful, but they constrained their guest list to 40 people. And it was because they constrained it to 40 people that they were able to hold on to this venue that they really, really, really wanted to have their wedding at. In other cases, people really valued family. And so they wanted to have family involved. And I've been to weddings where they have had 300 people and they didn't spend a lot of money by asking members of the family to bring some food. Now, maybe hear that asking your guests to do a potluck for my wedding. You go, that's crazy. I think it all depends on your values. It depends on, on, on exactly what your value. If, if, if you really value your guests not having to pitch in at all to throw the wedding, then the caterer for you is probably pretty important. If you don't value that, my sister and my brother-in-law were married in a tent behind their house. And it was a fantastic party. But other people hear tent behind my house and go, oh, forget it. I don't want it. Mm. So I think it's it, it again, even when you just look at the wedding, I think it's a microcosm of what we tell people when it comes to your expenses in general, which is spend lavishly on the things that you really like and cut ruthlessly on the things that you really don't care about. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I would echo that. So, you know, I've I've brought food to a potluck wedding before. Uh, it was friends of mine. They got married at a campground. All of the guests stayed in tents and we all like hung out and had a big camp out together for three days. It was a pretty- We all brought food. Yeah. It was great. It was a pretty intense wedding. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was, a, it was like a weekend, all weekend party. But yeah, we all brought food. You know, we, we all had our various assignments. We brought food. We brought booze from Costco. We uh, had a whole schedule where we took shifts volunteering as the bartender we had one particular person who was pretty good at photography, like she was the unofficial official photographer. Everyone just pitched in and it was a big community wedding. Did you enjoy it? Yeah, it was great. It was great. It was like just a, a giant camp out party. But again, as you know, people are going to hear this and they're going to go, yeah, not for me. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. You know, I, I once upon a time, I used to be married and I don't talk about it very often, but uh, we eloped. And, you know, that's not for everyone, but we, it cost $300 and we had plenty of money. We just didn't want to bother. Didn't want that, uh, that expense. Yeah. Just wasn't important. Yeah. And, that, and that's where I think leading with priorities versus budget is the, is the key. But if they have a big party, Paula, mm -hmm. I think it'd be absolutely right. And, uh, completely in line with, uh, Gail's values to invite her favorite podcasters to come. Gal's values. Gail, whatever. Gal. Gal Godot. The last thing I'd say is don't let anyone judge you for wanting to spend lavishly on a wedding. Like if you sit down and make a list of your goals and the amounts and the timelines and you realize, hey, there's plenty of room in the budget to throw a lavish wedding, do it up. The fire community can sometimes get a little judgy about like what's a quote unquote worthwhile expense and what's not. So there is a bit of a cultural ethos of world travel or RV living is totally worthwhile, but golfing is not. And to that, I say, don't let anyone tell you what you value. If you want to spend all your money scuba diving, that's great. But if you want to spend all your money collecting trolls and figurines and board games, then don't let the voices in the fire community be like, oh, no, you uh, stuff doesn't matter. You know what I mean? Like, who cares? Who cares what other people think? So if you if if what you want is some big, lavish, beautiful wedding and there is no trade off that you'll regret, your goal ultimately is to minimize the likelihood of future regret. 
So thank you, Gal, Gail. for asking that question. And good luck with whatever you decide. We'll come back to this episode after this word from our sponsors. After years of contracts with fine print and years of getting ripped off by big wireless providers, if we've learned anything, it's that there's always a catch. And so when I first heard that Mint Mobile offers premium wireless service starting at just 15 bucks a month, I'm like, eh, what's the catch? But after speaking with them, after using their service, it all made sense. There isn't one. Mint Mobile's secret sauce is that they're the first company to sell wireless service online only. They don't have brick and mortar overhead. So by cutting out those retail stores, they don't have crazy overhead costs that then get passed down to you in the form of mystery fees. So they're able to cut out that brick and mortar traditional retail overhead because they're online only, and they pass those sweet savings down to you. I've been using Mint Mobile for more than a year at this point, and their wireless service is as good as my much, much more expensive previous provider. All the plans come with unlimited talk and text and high-speed data delivered on the largest 5G network in the nation. You can use your own phone, you can keep your phone number and existing contacts, and if you're not totally satisfied, they've got a seven-day money-back guarantee. To get your new wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month and get the plan shipped to your door for free, go to mintmobile.com slash Paula. That's mintmobile.com slash Paula. Cut your wireless bill to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash Paula, P-A-U-L-A. If you're a business owner, the thought of losing access to all your files and information is probably terrifying. But ransomware attacks can happen to anyone. And what's worse is that it can take up to an average of 23 days to recover stolen information. Think of how disruptive that would be, especially if your team is small. Ignite is the first file system that includes sophisticated ransomware detection and recovery tools. So if your team collaborates across Google Docs, Microsoft 365, Salesforce, Slack, those types of tools, it can protect that data. One of the things I like about it is that a lot of security software has a horrible user experience, and that is not at all the case with Ignite. It has a pleasant user experience, and that matters. With Ignite, you can shut down compromised accounts with a click of a button. You can see who has access to key documents from your dashboard. And if something goes wrong, you can recover files in hours rather than days. Learn more about how Ignite can protect your business from ransomware. Start your free trial today at egnyte.com. That's egnyte.com. Our next question comes from Mike. Hi, Paula. This is Mike calling from the Midwest. I discovered your podcast about eight months ago and have been devouring the episodes. Big thanks to you, Joe, and the rest of the team for all your work. I can't tell you how much it means. I'm looking for advice on where to put money for short to medium term savings goals, say over a three to five year time span. A little about me. I'm 36, single. I have no debt. I live in a large Midwestern city and make about $70,000 per year. I've currently got about $75,000 in retirement savings. Most of that is in a 403B account, though I recently opened a Roth IRA, thanks to you and Joe, and I've started making monthly contributions to that as well. I contribute about 9% of my income to my 403B. I get a 10% employer match, which is fantastic, and I contribute about 2% to my Roth IRA. Now, I've also amassed about $60,000 in a high-yield savings account over the years, where I earn about 1% interest, and I've just come to the realization that having this much money in a savings account is not ideal. Some of this money I'll be diverting to my Roth. I also opened a brokerage account with Fidelity, where I've started to dip my toe in the water with stock index funds, so maybe putting some of this money there as well. But I'm trying to figure out what to do with the rest of it. There's a good chance I'll be buying my first home in the next three to five years. Marriage is also in the cards. My impression is that stock index funds may be too risky for that short of a time horizon. I love the idea of a CD, but returns are so low, it hardly seems worth it. I'm actually gravitating towards the idea of putting a good portion of that savings into bond index funds, something I really haven't heard you guys talk about. Uh, you know, I'm looking for something that's low risk but that will beat my savings account return. Any thoughts on bond index funds or other places to stash your cash for the short to medium term savings goals? 
Really appreciate all the work you do. Looking forward to hearing your response. Thanks. Mike, thank you for that question and congratulations on everything that you're building. You seem to be in a great financial position. You're saving, you're investing, and you're making some very strong moves. To your question, yes, I agree, $60,000 given your income, your savings rate, given the proportion of net worth that that represents, that is quite a lot of money to keep in a savings account. So I think that your instinct to divert some of that into investments is wise. There are a couple of ways that you can handle this. One, as you suggested, is to invest a portion of it into bond index funds, which are fantastic. Vanguard has a total bond market index fund that is a fantastic catch-all of the bond universe. You could also put a portion of it into a balanced fund, which will provide you with some layer of asset allocation. But notice in, in both of the things that I just said, because right now we're, the conversation is veering towards product, and there's sort of two conversations we need to have here. There's product and there's strategy. Strategically, you don't want to move the entire $60,000, and I don't get the sense that you're going to do this, but I just want to uh, make this explicit. You don't want to move the entire $60,000 into just one vehicle or one product. You want to take that 60000 and cut it up into different buckets and then move each portion of it into a different type of asset. So there's going to be some amount of that $60,000 that you'll want to keep in cash, store it in a high-yield savings account, and let it sit there remaining in cash. There will be another portion of it that you might want to put into a bond index fund or that you might want to put into a balanced fund. There might be a portion of it that you want to put into treasury inflation-protected securities or into a money market or into Ginny Mays. So you'll want to take the 60000 and cut it up into a whole bunch of smaller sums and move each of them into assets with different types of characteristics. And so that's strategically what you'd want to do. And then when we move off of strategy and onto product – all of those types of products, those types of assets that I just named would be good options for the appropriate sliver of it. And then to the natural follow-up question, all right, what is the appropriate chopping up of it? How do I slice the pie? A lot of that's going to depend on what you think this money will be used for and on the flexibility of that goal. So if you think that this money is going to be used for sure in the next three to five years, and that is a fairly rigid goal, then you'll want to be more conservative than you otherwise would be if you would ideally like to use this in the next three to five years, but you're flexible on that. Yeah, I totally agree. If the chance that you're going to use all of that uh, money over the next uh, five years is is very good, then I think going as far as the balance fund might be a little far. So what a balance fund does is balances stocks with bonds. We also have problems, though, Paula, in the bond market in general, because with interest rates going up, a lot of people think that there's there's this thing called the bond teeter-totter, and people think that the teeter-totter is between stocks and bonds, and it isn't. Sometimes stocks and bonds both go up at the same time. Sometimes they go down at the same time. But one correlation that sticks is bonds and interest rates. And when interest rates go up, the value bonds you hold right now go down in value, which is why, you know, you and I in the past have been fans of, and I think I'll just speak for myself. I'm still a fan of Ginny Mays. I think you are too, but mm -hmm. this is a year where you're still looking at a loss in Ginny Mays of about one and a half percent. So if, if you invested in Ginny Mays, the beginning of this year, doesn't make it a bad category, but like every category, they sometimes have times where it's great to invest in and someone it's not as good. And Ginny Mays this year would have lost a little bit of money. And that's a very conservative place to be. You know, I bonds right now, though, are a are a, an area where I've seen a lot of people uh, talking about uh, it's a nice place because of inflation. And as we've seen inflation all over the place around us, investing in Treasury inflation protected securities might be just a good little bump if he thinks he's going to need it sooner rather than later. So I think I think there's three ways to do this. I looked at a bond index, and one bond index that I like is the Fidelity Bond Index. Fidelity Bond Index down 1.76%. Doesn't surprise me. Doesn't lose money often. Lost money in 2013, and this year, looking at the last uh, looking at the last 10 years, 
but that historically has been a fine place if you decide that, you know, I am I am going to go with bonds this year. If he did want some money longer, Vanguard has a fantastic balanced index. And by the way, these are not recommendations. These are some dude on the internet <laughs> telling you about a few that that he likes. But uh, this Vanguard balanced index has an expense ratio of 0 0.07. And the allocation is going to be about half stocks, half bonds. And so this year so far as we record this, it's up 14%. Now, once again, because it's up 14, doesn't tell you at all what it's going to do in the future. Mm. But, it, but the fact that you've got stocks that have done very well balancing out bonds, which have not done well because of the threat of rising interest rates, a balanced fund was a nicer place to be. But I'm still with Paula. I would not have a balanced fund unless you've got at least five years, uh, then I might have it. You know, a third option I was thinking about, if you found a target date fund for like 2025, and, and I'm not a huge fan of most target date funds, Vanguard, I think has good target date funds, mm -hmm. but a lot Vanguard's of companies- Vanguard's the only place I would get a target date fund from. Yeah, target date funds are just littered with unnecessary fees. Mm -hmm. uh, Except for from Vanguard. It's the only brokerage that I've been able to find yeah. with low fee target date. But I think mm -hmm. the cool thing about a target date fund for 2025, Paula, is that it will start off a little more aggressive and it will get less aggressive. Its goal is to lock things in by 2025, right? Ish. And so I think that, okay, well, are we going to have the through versus land the plate argument? Technically, its goal is to uh, invest money for somebody who's going to retire in 2025, but then have a 30-year retirement. Right. Which is why you don't want to put all your money there. I, I still think, though, that, that this is a time when a target date fund that's very conservative because they're going to uh, diversify the funds in a way that you'll have money in different things inside of that target date fund and you don't have to do uh, do that yourself. So I also think that might be a valid part of your strategy. With a combination of these different types of products, if you were to put some money in a target date fund, some in a balanced fund, some in treasury inflation protected securities, some in straight up cash, I mean, he's layering diversification on top of diversified funds. Yeah. Joe, you mentioned that the bond index fund went down this year for the first time since 2013. I remember from a previous podcast episode, you also mentioned that 2013 was the same year that Ginny Mays went down. Yeah. And Ginny Mays down, going down again this year. I mean, because it's a type of bond, conservative mm -hmm. type of bond, bonds doing poorly in tandem, it, w w which I think, uh, Paula, I think you may be bringing up a good point, which is that often we look at our portfolio and we go, this fund sucks. <laughs> and we don't do a good job of comparing that fund to what's going on in the larger universe of things. So if you have a bond fund and a stock fund right now, you might think, I want to get rid of these horrible bonds because bonds stink and stocks are great, which, as you know, is a false conclusion. Mm -hmm. uh, they're actually made for completely different types of investors uh, looking to do different things normally over different time frames. So right. if all bonds are going down right now, it does not mean that your bond fund is horrible. Right. And the contrarian approach, I mean, sure, bonds – are a bit beat up right now, but we're talking about a three to five year time horizon, possibly with some additional flexibility baked into that. This is what what excites me is that, you know, Wall Street does a great job of predicting this stuff. So bonds have been really beaten up and battered as they expect interest rates to rise. Mm -hmm. At some point, when is that all baked in, right? When is right. the expectation baked in? And then we start making money, which means, by the way, that certificates of deposit might actually be back in vogue again soon, which makes me giddy because it's been like a decade. Where have you been, my friend, CD? It's been like a decade and a half since CDs were worth anything. I know. I feel like CDs come knocking at the door and I'm like, who are you? I don't recognize you anymore. It's been so long. Yeah. You know, you're in an inflationary environment when there are products that are actually good for savers out there. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. Which, which also, by the way, let's look at all the dominoes, right? What does that mean? If it's a great time for savers, it's a crappy time to be a borrower. And it's not a crappy time yet, but Paula, you can see it coming, which means if if you're waiting to get your debt house in order or you're here listening and you're thinking, well, you know, save versus pay down my debt versus invest versus the way things are going now, it could be a horrible time to be a borrower. 
in the future? Well, in an inflationary environment, if you have a fixed rate loan, then you're sitting pretty. But you're if you good. have an adjustable rate, then sure. you're effed. Which is what happens with credit cards, right? Happens mm -hmm. with credit cards, adjustable rate mortgages. But if you have a very flexible interest rate schedule, it might be time to lock those in. Right. And if you're thinking about buying a home, locking in a fixed rate mortgage now, while rates are low, could be a wise move. But yeah, absolutely anything with variable interest rates or adjustable interest rates, as we get into an inflationary environment, those types of products are going to hurt. So thank you, Mike, for asking that question. And I hope that we were able to outline both strategy and varieties of assets that you can use to manage that $60,000. We'll come back to this episode in just a minute. But first... Gusto wasn't just built for small businesses. It was built for the people behind small businesses. They offer payroll, benefits, onboarding, and HR all in one place. So you can get fast, easy payroll, including W-2s and 1099s. You can offer your team health benefits, 401ks. You can even use them to design offer letters, have onboarding checklists, software set up. They'll automatically file and pay all state, local, and federal payroll taxes so that you don't have to worry about it. And if you have a tough HR question, you get direct access to certified HR experts. Also, if you're moving from another provider, they can transfer all your data for you. Now, here's the best part. Because you're a listener of the Afford Anything podcast, you get three months totally free. So just try them. See if you like it. All you have to do is go to gusto.com slash Paula. Again, that's gusto.com slash Paula, G-U-S-T-O dot com slash Paula. To get three months free when you run your first payroll, go to gusto.com slash Paula. Are you interested in starting a side hustle or starting a business and you need to build a website? If so, that website needs to be hosted somewhere and Bluehost can provide amazing hosting for less than $3 per month, but you can only get that price when you use our special link. If you go to affordanything.com slash Bluehost, you can sign up for hosting for your website for less than three bucks a month. The normal price is about $8 a month, but you get a big discount when you go to affordanything.com slash Bluehost. And by the way, if you don't know how to set up hosting, if you want a tutorial, if you go to affordanything.com slash start a blog, that'll give you a step-by-step -step tutorial in how to set up your website in less than five minutes. We even include a YouTube video that shows us doing it in under five minutes. So again, affordanything.com slash Bluehost, which is where you can get the hosting, and affordanything.com slash start a blog, that's where you'll see the tutorial. Good luck with your new business. Joe, our final caller, is also anonymous. What name should we give her? Well, you know, we've talked a lot about how things change and how opinions change and how what's right changes depending on your time frame. And there is a wonderful journalist and author who passed away last year who talked about this for a long time. I really enjoyed all of her work. Her name is Gail Sheehy. And Gail, oh, my goodness. Oh, no. And, and Gail's <laughs> incredible. So I thought... I thought that uh, it should be Gail. Oh, we can't have two Gales in the same episode. <laughs> well, this is a completely different Gail. And like you said, that was Gal, even though i you know, going to go with Gail. This with that journalist one. is named Gail Sheehy, you said? How do you spell her last name? S-H-E-E. -E. Oh, S-H-E-E-H-Y. I'm seeing it right now. Yes. Gail Sheehy, American author. Yes. Ooh, she was the author of 17 books and numerous high-profile articles for magazines such as New York and Vanity Fair. Yeah, wonderful writer. Talks about uh, aging. She was the first person that I read that talked about how if you were born in the year 2000, you had a one in three chance of living to see uh, 2100, that you would probably live to be over 100 years old. Or that there was a much higher probability of you living to be 100 years old and probably even up to 130 years old. So she uh, she did a lot of work on on change over time. And I think that's been kind of with our first two questions, how our feelings about weddings have changed 
and then how depending on your time frame with Mike's goal, things change. So yeah, I think it's a two gale episode. <laughs> I am uh, frantically searching for her middle name right now and I can't <laughs> seem to find it. I, I found her maiden name, but I can't find her middle name. Paul, if you want to know truthfully what I did, I put in mm -hmm. celebrity's name, Gail. <laughs> did you really? Just so that we could do this. Oh my goodness. <laughs> and then I found Gail Sheehy, who uh, is work I truly do love. I'm like, there, there we go. And I am putting in, oh, oh, let's, let's give this a go. Wait, um, I, it's not on her Wikipedia page, so I doubt this is going to come up, but Gail Sheehy, middle name. And now I'm Googling ah. salt in the wound. Darn it. I can't find her middle name. Well, you can give her an honorary one, but we know it's Gail. So <laughs> I'm going to call this person Sheehy in honor of Gail's last name. Perfect. Perfect. But you can still call her Gail. Oh, I will. Hi, Paula. My name is Anonymous, and I've been listening to you guys for about two or three years now. Um, once we got the idea about doing real estate, your podcast popped up, and I've listened ever since. Um, so to give you a little background about our family, uh, my husband and I are both 32 years old. Um, right now, we have 10 months of emergency funds saved. Um, we are currently contributing about 12000 a year towards our brokerage. We just started doing that this year. We both max out our uh, Roth IRAs at 12K a year combined. We are both contributing 3% to our 401Ks or 403Bs. Both of our, well, my husband's company only matches three and mine contributes 5% regardless of how much I put in. Aside from that, we're also saving 24000 a year towards our next investment, which might be another rental home or starting a business. We haven't decided yet. I have an old 403B um, with about 40K sitting, and my husband has nothing from his former jobs. Uh, we have two mortgages, one being our rental home and one car loan at just 1.9% interest, and we have no other debt. My questions are, number one, should we be contributing more towards our 401Ks from our employers? They're not Roth accounts. I've also considered opening an HSA or contributing more to our brokerage. Are there benefits of one versus the other? When I explored my company's investment options, it's very limited. So I'm just keeping my funds in their aggressive target date. Um, my number two question is, two years ago when our child was born, I sort of panicked because we didn't have IRAs and neither of us were getting retirement plans at our jobs that we held at the time. With the financial planner's help, we started our IRAs, yay. And soon after, we both got jobs that now offer retirement. So that's awesome. But the planner also convinced us to buy a mix of whole and term life insurance. Now that I've been doing more of my own research and the home is a bit more stable with the pandemic having gone on so long and the baby being bigger, I feel sort of embarrassed and like maybe I made a mistake. We're spending about $700 a month between term and whole insurance. Uh, my husband and I are both first generation to college and first generation Americans. So we're figuring out a lot of this on our own. And I feel like I was just convinced that generational wealth was built through insurance. Now I feel like, damn, should I be putting the money towards our brokerage, HSA, starting a 529? Help. Should we have whole life at all? Most of what I'm seeing says term is good enough and building wealth is more about investments. Any guidance you can provide would be so appreciated. Thank you. Sheehy, thank you so much for calling in. Great question. First of all, congratulations on everything that you've built. You've got a 10-month emergency fund. You and your husband are both maxing out your Roth IRAs. You're both getting your full company match inside of your 401k and 403b. You're saving $24,000 every year towards your next investment, whether that's a rental property or starting your own business. And you're starting to build out your brokerage account as well. So that's absolutely fantastic. You're on a great track. I love that you are debt-free other than mortgages and a very reasonable car loan. So you're on an absolutely fantastic track. Congratulations on everything that you've built so far and everything that you're continuing to build. Now, you asked two questions. Your first question was whether or not you should contribute more towards your 401ks. The first thing that comes to mind, and I'm saying this not just for you, but for the benefit of everyone who's listening, the first answer that always comes to mind immediately is, are you getting your full company match? And in your case, you are. You and your husband are both getting your full company match. So then, to the question of whether or not you should invest money 
in a 401k in excess of what is required in order to get that match, the questions that you want to ask yourself are, am I willing to accept the limitations on the investment options in exchange for access to additional tax-advantaged funds? So in other words, the benefit to investing in a 401k or 403b is that you get a tax advantage by doing so. In this case, their traditional 401k is 403bs, they're not Roths, which means that the money that you'll invest there will be tax deferred. That is certainly an advantage, but that advantage comes with the trade-off of being limited in the investment options that you can select from. And as you mentioned, your company has very limited investment options. So my question back to you is, among those limited investment options, how much do they suck? Like, are your options so sucky, so high fee, so bleh, that you would rather look to some other type of account, like a taxable brokerage account where you lose the tax advantage, but you have more flexibility? Or uh, you mentioned an HSA. We'll talk about that in a second. Are the options inside of your company 401k so sucky that you'd rather go elsewhere? If so, that's a strong argument for going elsewhere. If not, then I think there could be a lot of value in capturing the tax advantage that comes with putting money into a 401k, even if it means that you have to be in a type of investment fund that you wouldn't otherwise choose. Now, you did mention opening an HSA. My question back to you, are you currently in a health plan that is HSA compatible? If so, open an HSA, absolutely, because an HSA is going to give you the same tax-deferred advantage as putting money into a 401k, but with much, much greater flexibility. Because if you have a qualified health expense that you need to spend money on, you can always have the option of spending money inside of your HSA on that qualified medical expense. And if you don't, then when you reach retirement age, you can draw down that money in the same way that you could money from a 401k. So certainly, if you're in a health plan that's HSA compatible, you get a lot more flexibility with the money that's in an HSA. So go with that first. So that's my answer to the first aspect of your question. Now to the second aspect of your question, which relates to the fact that you have a mix of whole life insurance and term life insurance. I agree that for most cases, term life insurance is good enough. You want enough insurance such that you'll be covered for the duration of time that anyone who depends on you, your, such as your child, and, and any other family members that might depend on you as well, you want to make sure that for as long as they depend on you, they'll be protected. You said your child was born two years ago, so a term life plan that lasts for perhaps 20 years until your child is 22 should be sufficient. If you want to extend that out even to 30 years, even that, that would be fine and it would certainly be a lot cheaper than the $700 that you're spending right now. Because if you were to take the cost difference between what the 700 that you're currently spending and the reduced amount that you would be spending if you had term only, if you were to calculate that difference and then move the gap between those two numbers into a taxable brokerage account, you could do a lot better and create a greater amount of wealth over the long term if you were to invest that money. I would say 90% uh, directionally what I was going to say. There's a short answer here on the insurance side and there's a long answer. The short answer is what Paula said, you probably should get rid of it. And part of the reason I think you should get rid of it actually has more to do with the fact that you don't really know why you have it and also that you think you're spending $700 a month because you're not. Now, I know there's $700 coming out of your pocket, but the way that permanent insurance works is that part of that covers the premium and the rest is going into an investment inside of that product. So there is some piece of this, which is expense. And I 
I want to know what that is. And by the way, the whole life portion of your insurance will always cost more than term life. And it's because and there have been different statistics on this, but a statistic I saw recently was that roughly 2% of all of the term policies actually ever get cashed in for the death benefit, meaning 98% of the time the insurance company keeps all that money and you didn't use it, which by the way is fantastic for everybody, right? It's great for you that you didn't die and it's great for them because they were able to offer you a less expensive product with a whole life insurance product that expectation that they're going to pay at some point is far, far, far higher. It's meant to last your whole life. It's meant to be there when you die. So for that reason, the cost of insurance is going to be exponentially higher than it will be for a term life policy. So it sounds like what your insurance person, your, your planner did was a hybrid of these, probably enough term life insurance to last uh, in through that time that you would need it, whatever your kids' ages are or, or would be, or maybe even until 60. And then for uh, wealth building, they have you socking some money away into a, a permanent life insurance policy. But if you're going to use this type of approach, and this isn't just me, by the way, and I know that there's going to be people tuning out going, no, 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 it's just all term and invest the difference. Well, the sad fact is a lot of people never do invest the difference. They'll cut out the whole life insurance, Paula, but they forget the second half. Now, I don't believe that's this community. You don't go listen to financial podcast and not invest the difference, but just in, what did you call it? Default society? Mm -hmm. in yeah, default, the default world. In the default world, people here buy term and invest the difference. They buy term insurance. They never invest the difference. So you have to do what Paula said, which is invest the rest. However, there are tax advantages and there are policies that work really well with this type of approach that people, you know, people as well known as Ed Slot or uh, David McKnight, who has a great, uh, a few great books about zero tech brackets and is very well respected in the, in, in the overall investment community. It really doesn't have that stereotypical, I'm trying to hawk a bunch of life insurance so I can get a big commission approach. But because of the nature of life insurance, if you use it well and you do it when you're young, this is so hard to go into, but the cost of insurance is incredibly low, which means a huge chunk of that $700 is going into your pocket. And that's money that if it's the right type of policy, you can take out tax free later. And if you're already maxing out your Roth IRA, this can be a nice secondary vehicle. So I'm not as, I'm not as, I'm negative about this because you don't understand it because of the fact that you don't know really where it fits in your plan. I'm less sure that it's actually the wrong thing as much as I think it may be the wrong thing for you. I think this can actually be a fine thing if you, if you use it, but the problem, Paula, is this freaking PhD level stuff, right? I mean, when it comes to personal finance, there's the keep it simple stuff. And there's just this, so this is kind of high level heady stuff where you have to be looking for a certain life insurance product. You have to know what's called the modified endowment contract amount is, which is the maximum amount you could put in it and still have it act as a tax shelter versus violate a bunch of tax law. Um, and you have to be riding that line. You also want a policy where you can change the death benefit amount over time. So there's there's so many moving parts. It's so complicated. For that reason, I don't like, I don't like it. But that doesn't mean it's not good. Hmm. This could be a really, really, really good plan, especially with her cash flow because she has monster cash flow. The big problem I have with life insurance policies in general is that they require you to ongoing. You, you know, she's got this seven hundred dollar number. To make this work, she probably has to commit to that number for a long time, mm -hmm. right? To sock this money away for a long time. And the variable I always had when I was a financial planner is, do I think that my client's cash flow is going to be good enough for a long enough period and other stuff isn't going to come up that we can commit to this approach? Because this, th the problem with these life insurance approaches, they work really well until they don't. And when they don't, that cost of insurance can be so high on that whole life portion of the insurance policy that it can not only make the strategy bad, it can make the strategy just horrible. So we can go from fantastic to horrible with one or two years of not being able to commit to the same thing that you began at it. So also for that reason, it's, it's tough for me to recommend. 
Given that she and her husband are not maxing out their 401ks, 403bs, do you think that would be a better alternative? 401k is clearly a better alternative. The time that I use this are when we're when my client, and by the way, this would end up, Paula, being mm-hmm. maybe once every 18 months, I would use this type of a strategy. Mm-hmm. Uh, so on the very rare client. Yes. Yeah. Somebody with monster cash flow, they're maxing out every other place available that they have. They're socking money into their HSA if they're eligible for one. Uh, Roth, generally these people, by the way, aren't eligible for the Roth, so we got to do the backdoor strategy for the Roth. And we're maxing out the 401k. We're maxing out every other thing they have. And they still have monster cash flow. And they have goals that are long-term goals, not short-term goals, right? Because life insurance works way better with long-term goals than with short-term goals. With those people, (laughs) this, this unicorn person, I then bring it up and then it was my job as a financial planner to make sure they understand it. Because if I get hit by a truck, Mm -hmm. it's so convoluted that if I get hit by a truck and they don't understand it, I did them a huge disservice because they don't know why they have it. Mm. So in Gail Sheehy's case. Yeah, I don't like it for a couple of reasons. I don't like it for the 401k reason. I also don't like the fact that she's calling you and I asking about it Mm. because then that clearly means that she doesn't trust the person that sold it to her Mm -hmm. and she should probably exit the plan. And and she also thinks she's spending $700 to be clear. I am 90% sure she's not spending $700. She's Mm. probably spending $150, which still is a lot of money. She's cash flow outing. She is cash flow outing $700. But if she thinks that's all life insurance expense, then she doesn't understand what she has. Mm. I'd say for the 401k, 403b element alone, there are so many alternative options that she can be putting money into. HSA, 401k. Can I bring up one thing in regards to, and and you partially answered this saying, are the fees so bad that there are no options there and she should need to go elsewhere? When Mm -hmm. you actually look at that between the math and the ease of putting money in, Mm -hmm. There were so many times, Paula, when people would tell me, ah, the fees are high, so I didn't do it. And clearly the better answer was to put money into the plan right. than to avoid the plan. Because the tax advantage that you get is so significant that even a higher fee, you're still net positive. And especially if you're not eligible for a traditional IRA, if you're over the income limit to deduct a traditional IRA and you're doing the pre-tax plan, then then by all means, that, that fee is going to have to be monster high, just monster high for you to forego the 401k. Yeah. That being said, there are other benefits to putting money into a taxable brokerage account. I mean, certainly you lose the tax deduction, but you gain flexibility. And as you and I have talked about on previous episodes, Joe, there's often a trade-off between optimization and flexibility. So if she wants to hold money in a taxable brokerage account so that she can continue to invest that money, but she can also have the flexibility of being able to tap those funds at any time without having to go through some complicated SEPP 72T rigmarole, that is another advantage that she would have by prioritizing a taxable brokerage account, which is to say... The decision as to whether to put money into a 401k versus a taxable brokerage account in part depends on what that money is going to be used for. Is it money that she doesn't plan to tap until she reaches traditional retirement age, or is it money that she wants to be able to access? If you think about it, an account like a 401k, a 403b, an IRA, that the tax advantage that you get there is fundamentally a deal between you and the government in which the government promises to give you a tax advantage in exchange for you promising not to touch those funds until you reach a certain age. So if you stop thinking of of it as a retirement bucket and think of it instead as an age-restricted bucket, then the question is, are you willing to accept that trade-off or would you rather have the flexibility of easier access to those funds? and wider selection of how to invest those funds, even though that comes with the trade-off of losing the tax advantage. And I think all this, Paula, reaffirms that there are two pieces of the equation. And we kind of end this episode the same place that we started, which is that it's as much about your goals and you understanding 
where you're going, your strategy first, as it is the actual uh, tools you use to get there. Once you once you have the strategy and you know the time frame on when you're going to spend the money, what you're spending it for, then choosing the the strategy to get there will be much easier. Well, Joe, we did it. That's our show for today. Wow. Already. Already. Big thanks to all the gales. Big <laughs> thanks to all the gales. We appreciate it. Joe, where can people find you if they'd like to hear your uh, additional side of snark? <laughs> you, will, you will find me uh, as the ringmaster at the greatest money show on earth, the Stacking Benjamin Show, which is a three ring circus uh, every Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And we just did an episode with uh, food writer Corey Mintz. Corey is a guy who has, who dives into how little we know about where our food comes from and also the things that go on behind the scenes at restaurants. And some of these things are disturbing. And you obviously want to make sure that your money goes to things that you value and people that you value. So uh, I thought it was a great interview with, with Corey. And asking a few more questions making sure that your waiter, the people in the kitchen, that those people are also uh, being taken care of by the restaurant owner. Because I don't know if you know this, Paula, but a lot of those people aren't even paid minimum wage. And the way that restaurant owners get around it and the fact that it's so opaque is a little disturbing. Hmm. It also made me, this interview also made me like these food delivery apps even less than I already liked them before. Hmm. Here's a here's a, a statistic: people that use food delivery service apps, by and large, they were originally made for busy people, thinking that busy people would use them, people that have high income, and would use them for convenience. The bad news is, people that increasingly studies show are using them are the people that can least afford them, mm. and the restaurant owner has to give a big concession to use them, uh, so the restaurant owner loses money. The customer pays additional value. The only person who's really winning is the person in the middle. And by the way, that doesn't include the Uber Eats driver. The Uber Eats driver also is largely being taken advantage of as well. So you're saying the person in the middle is the app creator. The app creator is making money hand over fist, which is also funny. And this is a, this is a complete side note, but I just saw a Domino's pizza commercial where Domino's in every city now is going and buying coupons to local restaurants Mm -hmm. And their commercial is, if you can't eat from Domino's, if, if you're not going to eat Domino's, who hires their own drivers and doesn't have an additional cost above the normal additional delivery costs that they have for their own drivers, uh, eat at a local restaurant. I was so surprised to see a Domino's commercial where they're telling you, don't use these third-party services, go eat someplace local, support your local restaurant. Hmm. This sounds like an interesting... It's a very, this is the longest answer you've ever given to where can people find you, but this sounds like a really interesting interview. It is so nuanced and it's so wild. And I wanted to talk to him for 16 hours and mm. we talked for about 25, 25 <laughs> minutes, <laughs> minutes, not hours. Everybody's <laughs> like, I don't have that kind of time, Joe. <laughs> but uh, yeah, Corey Mintz uh, recently on uh, the Stacking Benjamin show. Interesting. Maybe we'll see if we can get him on this show. So the Stacking Benjamin show, you can find that anywhere where you download podcasts. And you also hear Paula every Monday when, not every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, every, <laughs> but nearly every Friday. Thank you so much for tuning in. This is the Afford Anything Podcast. If you enjoyed today's episode, please do three things. Number one, share it with a friend or a family member. That's the single most important thing that you can do to spread the message of financial independence. Number two, subscribe to the show notes at affordanything.com slash show notes. That's affordanything.com slash show show notes. Number three, you know, actually, I'm going to ask you to do four things. Number three, make sure that you hit follow in whatever app you're using to listen to this show. So open up Spotify, Pandora, Apple Podcasts, and hit the follow button. And number four, while you're there, please leave us a review. As of the time that I'm recording this, we have 2,863 reviews on Apple Podcasts. Please help us get to 3,000 by the end of the year. I want to thank Robin1042, who says, quote, this is one of many financial podcasts I listen to, and this one puts the most thought into their responses, including walking us through her or their thought processes, guests included. Baines112358 says, quote, I've listened to Paula's podcast for many years now. Although I'm not a real estate investor and tend to skip the real estate-focused episodes, 
Her interviews and personal finance material are top-notch. She does a good job of bringing on a variety of people with many different views and methods for being successful and asks insightful questions that helps focus the interviewee on giving insights helpful to the listener. I also enjoy the question and answer episodes like this one, Joe. Bam! So thank you to both of those reviewers and please, please leave us a review in whatever app you're using to listen to this show. Those reviews are incredibly helpful in allowing us to book amazing guests. Thank you again for tuning in. This is the Afford Anything Podcast. My name is Paula Pant. You can find me on Instagram at Paula Pant, P-A-U-L-A-P-A-N-T, and I will catch you in the next episode. Here is an important disclaimer. There's a distinction between financial media and financial advice. Financial media includes everything that you read on the internet, hear on a podcast, see on social media that relates to finance. All of this is financial media. That includes the Afford Anything podcast, this podcast, as well as everything Afford Anything produces. And financial media is not a regulated industry. There are no licensure requirements. There are no mandatory credentials. There's no oversight board or review board. The financial media, including this show, is fundamentally part of the media. And the media is never a substitute for professional advice. That means anytime you make a financial decision or a tax decision or a business decision, anytime you make any type of decision, you should be consulting with licensed credential experts, including but not limited to attorneys, tax professionals, certified financial planners, or certified financial advisors. Always, always, always consult with them before you make any decision. Never use anything in the financial media, and that includes this show, and that includes everything that I say and do. Never use the financial media as a substitute for actual professional advice. All right, there's your disclaimer. Have a great day. Seventy-two divided by three is twenty-four. You're a math whiz. <laughs> I own a phone. <laughs> Bragger. <laughs>